I'm Christy Noel and uh, the author of Your Personal Career Coach and I am joined today by several of my co-authors and we're very excited to share with you some job search strategies to use during this time of COVID. We all know that the job market has changed dramatically over the last six months and we want to help you with some strategies that have proven to be very effective during this uh, challenging and tumultuous time in the economy and in um, healthcare and the world in general with uh, the entrance of COVID-19. So we're very excited to have you here and looking forward to give you some actionable, actionable tips and some uh, ideas to propel your job search and hopefully give you some great luck going forward. So as you're all joining in, we would love to know where you are from. If you could um, put in the chat um, what city you're in or state or country, if you're outside of the United States, um, we'd love to know more about you. And while I do, while you do that, um, there's a couple of people on the um, presentation group with us and we're gonna give you full introductions, but we have some co-authors here. The publisher of Your Personal Career Coach is here, Leanne Garms, and Lianca Lyons is here, and she's going to be, <laughs> hi Lianca, uh, helping to manage the chat so that uh, if you have any questions or any comments or chats or anything, you can put those in and we will make sure to answer those at the end. Uh, we have a live Q&A session, so we want to, and those of you that already submitted the questions, uh, we have those and we will uh, be ready to address those as well. So I have a question. Um, Lianca, are you seeing me on the screen? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm seeing you. So I just want to make sure. Um, uh, that's great. So, okay. Are you seeing responses of where people are from? Because I am not seeing that. Yes, I am seeing that as well. Oh, great. Oh, here we go. Houston, Philadelphia, Durham, Michigan. North Carolina, Irvine, California. That's just down the street from me. Chattanooga, Boston, San Diego, a couple San Diegos. Awesome. So welcome again, and thank you for being here. We're very excited. Um, to give you some great information to get you started. Oh, and uh, because you're here live, we have a special giveaway at the end. So um, stick around and I'll show you, tell you how to get a, an ebook, a free ebook for being here live. Appreciate that. So um, if we can do the first poll, we'd like to know more about you and your current situation so we can tailor the, the material specifically to who's on the call with us. So the first poll we have is what your current situation is. Are you employed? Are you looking? Are you in what stage of your career? So is, are you looking for your first job? Are you in an early career, mid, late career? Um, so if you could just um, click, if you're comfortable, um, we'd love for you to click on one of the options so we can see who is here with us. And I can see some of the answers coming in. Great, so it looks like mostly we've got people looking for their first job or they're in mid-career and looking. So awesome, thank you for sharing that with us. And I think we'll have some good tips for, for either one of those groups. And then uh, if we could go to the next poll. And if you've been unemployed, I'd, we'd love to know like how long, just so we could see if you've been impacted primarily from COVID or, um, if this is something that happened recently or if it's been a little bit, oh, do we need to share the results? So I think every, they did both polls at the same time. So oh, okay. the results for the second one as well. Oh, okay, there it is, I see it now. Oh, okay, so we have, wow, that's pretty spread evenly for the length of time that people have been looking. So it looks like mostly it's recent and for a few of you, it's been a little bit longer. So. Um, Hopefully we can help uh, wh wherever you are to get some um, forward momentum. So I'm going to now go to, um, our slides.
and tell you about our presenters. So again, uh, hello, my name is Christy Noel. I'm a career expert and the author of, co-author of your personal career coach and the author of your career survival guide. And we'll tell you more about um, the book at the end. But I am joined today with, by Michelle Lando, another one of our contributing author, authors. Um, she's a certified pro professional resume writer, a branding expert, and the founder of Right Styles. Michelle aims to create a perfect personal branding package and helps others to get the confidence to put their best foot forward in a personal and professional light. Also with me is Dana Levy Dietrich. She's a senior resume writer and a personal brand strategist who's helped thousands of professionals in areas like marketing, design, technology, fashion, sales, and finance navigate through career transitions and develop high impact marketing tools. She's the director and founder of two niche professional branding and resume writing firms in New York City, Brooklyn Resume Studio and Canna Career Partners. So thank you for being here, Dana. And then last but not least is Kerry Stockdale. He is the CEO of Stockdale Stringer, an executive search and leadership solution for, firm and an award-winning international executive leadership consultant. He has over 35 years of working in executive talent acquisition, executive coaching, and the design and implementation of top tier HR programs and systems. So as you can see, we have quite a bit of expertise and talent on the panel today to help give you some great tips. So what we're gonna do is we're going to look at some of the common mistakes job seekers are making so that we can hopefully help you prevent, from, prevent making those mistakes. Um, give you what employees, employers are looking for on your resume so you can make sure that you have created your resume to stand out for what exactly they're looking for. We're going to teach you how to optimize your LinkedIn profile and then we'll give you some tips on mastering the virtual job interviews so that when you do get those interviews and they will be virtual, you can uh, excel at them and be really confident and comfortable on camera. So before we jump into that, um, these were some stats that Michelle had on her blog, and I thought they were really worth sharing because uh, it lays the groundwork for what the market is like right now, or these are actually pre-COVID stats. So this is what it, the, what it was like even before we became into this COVID world. So on average, each online posting receives about 250 resumes. And when we spoke yesterday as a panel, we think that that's probably higher now. So I don't say that to scare you off, um, but to have open your eyes to the competition and what's going on so that we can, these tips that you can implement will help you stand out amongst all of those resumes. 98% uh, of Fortune 500 companies use an ATS, an applicant tracking system, which is where the computer scans your resume before a human does. So Michelle's gonna give you some tips to, to know how to be, to be seen through the ATS system and so that you can have your resume optimized for that. We're gonna talk about some strategies for finding opportunities because half the jobs are filled internally before they're seen externally and 70% of jobs are never even posted. They're, they're filled before then. So being able to find jobs and uncover opportunities before they're even posted is very important in your job search. Referrals are extremely important. As you can see that uh, if you have a referral, you have a 50% shot of getting an interview versus 3% if you don't have a referral. So using your network, um, which is why we're going to talk about LinkedIn, not only for getting seen on the profile, but being able to use that to network and um, so you can get those resumes. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Kerry Stockdale and he's going to go through the common uh, mistakes that many job seekers are making. Kerry? In this section, we're going to provide you with how to get be the most productive with your time. And I believe you're going to come away with some great ideas to set yourself apart from the competition. In 35 years in HR, I've got 35 years in HR and, and always had recruiting responsibilities. So I've seen the good, the bad, and the real ugly. 
by attending this webinar, you're going to avoid a lot of common mistakes that even savvy interviewers uh, experience. So let's go with mistake number one. Uh, uh, which is relying on online postings. They have little value. You can get lost in running down non-productive trails. I would suggest spending a little time um, on job postings, uh, but you can target industry specific online platforms. They may be a little bit more helpful than, than others. Uh, and they do provide job posting to provide some job trends and where the jobs are and where the, uh, what companies are hiring and you can do some additional research on those companies and develop individual strategies uh, with them. Uh, so I would, I would suggest just spending 5% of your effort on online jobs, uh, job postings. Uh, unless, unless you're an exact fit for what that posting says, I wouldn't spend a lot of time with it. You already heard the stats that on, on average, there are 250 responses to each one of those online postings. That's uh, pretty chaotic in uh, any HR department to, to start sorting through that, even with applicant tracking systems. And especially if they have multiple jobs, not just the job that you're applying for, but they're generally have dozens of jobs that they're working. So you can just imagine if a recruiter has 10 jobs, he's got 250 responses to each one of those jobs. Uh, it gets to be pretty chaotic and it's not, you don't want to be caught up in, in all that. Mistake number two is mailing uh, unsolicited resumes, another poor choice of your time. Uh, HR become pretty jaded after a while and they're not interested in uh, seeing a resume that uh, has no value to them, has no initial value, and they won't, it won't even show up in their uh, uh, applicant tracking systems. So uh, with the statistics above, you heard that non-referrals have a 3% chance of getting an interview. Uh, that's not worth your time. Looking for, looking only for job openings. Uh, I wouldn't rely just on those job openings. There are lots of other jobs that are not posted on job openings that you can find uh, through research of individual companies that you have targeted. Uh, you can, um, do more development of, of those individual companies than uh, on, on job opening listings. Um, networking will uncover non-posted opportunities and we'll talk about networking uh, right now. But 70% of jobs never get posted is one of the statistics you saw. Uh, and there are all kinds of programs that companies have for not wanting to post jobs just because of the chaotic nature of, of, uh, uh, of that effort. So ineffective networking. I'd like to spend a little bit more time on networking. I, I would encourage you to have that as your primary focus. It's probably no surprise that you've heard that networking is important, but also doing it right. By doing it wrong, you can even hurt your chances of getting, uh, finding some great opportunities for you. Um, the first step would be developing, uh, I'm, I'm still on uh, networking. Uh, first step is developing a list of all your contacts through the years and, and then develop a target list, which would be first tier, uh, people you know, second tier, people who are a significant referral, and then start with people you know and are happy to hear from you. So that'll give you some confidence in, in how to network. But you need to prepare for that conversation. So many people don't prepare for that. They don't, it, it, um, uh, they, uh, don't look at uh, what their objectives are for the outcome of that call and they don't have any script. Uh, 
this is an advice call. You're looking for advice and some ideas and you'd like to come away. I would suggest that you set a goal of having two people, two referrals from each one of your networking calls, especially the start with the people that you know the best. Um, referrals have a 50% ch chance of getting an interview. That's where the percentages are that'll work for you. Um, by the way, on networking, be sure to uh, document your networking calls because you will want to, one, thank them for the time and effort. Number two is when you get placed, you should notify them and let them know that you've been placed and thank them again for their effort. These network networks that you develop could last you a lifetime. Uh, and also be sure to offer any assistance that you can be in the future. Uh, mistake number five is leaving yourself open to too many kinds of jobs. Uh, your job search is not prioritized. I want to be in marketing, but I also could be in operations. Uh, if you tell a networking contact that, they're not going to be able to keep up with you. They need to know specifically what do you want to do and when, when do you want to do it. So you need to go with what you know you can do and, and prioritize that search. Um, so be very clear and very focused. I want to be a marketing representative, for example. Uh, and if you're unfocused, you not only hurt yourself with that, that networking contact, uh, but you'll probably lose them as, as part of your network. And with one final thing on networks, there's only, uh, there's generally only one chance to make that phone call. So you need to really uh, think about how to make that phone call, what you want to get out of it, uh, and do the best job you can. Uh, mistake number six, uh, being unplanned on your search. Uh, it's great uh, to have goals. Uh, for example, the number of calls you go, you're planning on making that day, the number of companies that you've researched, the number of interviews you hope to have that week, and to target that. That will give you confidence if you're able to uh, accomplish those goals uh, and at the end of the day have a feeling of, of uh, that you're making a contribution to your job search. Uh, the next mistake uh, is being unplanned in your search. Uh, let me uh, catch up here with you. I'm sorry. Uh, the next one is doing it alone. Wasting time thinking about would be what would be easy or quick. Everyone needs an a trusted or experienced advisor or coach in this exercise that you're going through. It's not easy. Uh, and if you can afford uh, hiring a coach to take you through this, a career coach, and that's what we do, uh, you are able to uh, uh, get great advice Shorten the time of your search. Certainly focus on the really critical things that you need to do in your search and develop strategies that will, that will be inf uh, effective. Uh, they're not that expensive. You need to do research on them. One easy way to do that is on LinkedIn. So m mistake number eight uh, letting others control your job search. Now let's talk about recruiters. I'm currently a recruiter. I'm an executive search guy, executive recruiter. Uh, so I speak uh, very clearly about what uh, uh, recruiters can do for you or can't do for you. Generally at more entry level or mid manager jobs, you're dealing with recruiters who have very limited experience and you need to be the one to manage your, uh, your job, your job search. Uh, they are sometimes younger than you are. They're less experienced. They've only been with the company a short period of time. There's lots of turnover with recruiters. 
So be very careful and do your research on, on individuals that are helping you do your search. Now, if you find a good recruiter, hang on to them, stay in touch with them. That's part of your network. Mistake number nine, not preparing well enough for job interviews. Well, you finally scored that interview after months of work and you're ready for your first interview. Uh, research the company, practice your answers and questions. Uh, know that uh, the better that you prepare, the better you're going to do on, on, the, on the interview, but it's so important. There's plenty of information out there, including in Christie's book, uh, the uh, best ways to, uh, to interview especially now that we're doing online interviews, uh, video conferencing. And then mistake number 10, the last one, not knowing your market value. And that's where a, a coach comes in uh, much more so because I, I hear from individuals who tell me that they're valued at X and uh, come to find out that they've either undervalued themselves or overvalued themselves. That just happened the other day where they got an offer from a company and it was low and they thought they were worth much more. And after doing some research, they found out that that was the market marketplace. So that concludes my uh, job seeker mistakes and some tips on how to avoid those mistakes. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you gained some knowledge. There's a lot more information out there. And again, Christie's book would be a great place to start. Please remember, you're the one to manage the process. Don't let anyone else manage it. You can manage your career better than anyone else. So thank you for the time. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for sharing those uh, common mistakes. And hopefully they will be less common for those of you that are on the call with us today. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Lando, who's going to go through the three things that employers are looking for when they're scanning your resume, so you can make sure that they, you have what they're looking for. Michelle? Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, three things that employers look for when scanning a resume, you know, just like what we were talking about before, it is estimated that about 98% of Fortune 500 companies are using applicant tracking systems. So it is always really important to be aware of these systems and how they affect, uh, you know, your job search and all of that. Definitely, when anytime I write a resume, I'm sure um, Dana can agree with this. It's really important that your resume work both when an applicant tracking system is going to scan it, but also when a real person looks at it. Because at the end of the day, the real person is going to be the one that's hiring you. So it's really important to have a really good balance when it comes to writing a resume. So the first thing that employers will look for are keywords. Now, I actually started my career in recruiting. And one of the first things that we did when we had this influx of resumes is we would search for the right keywords. So does this person have the software knowledge? Does they Do they have, say, if it's you know an accountant do they, or someone in accounting, do they, are they able to use QuickBooks? You know, really basic information that can, you know, help you at the baseline sift through resumes and figure out if this person is worth spending a little bit more time on. So when you are writing a resume, it's really important to use the job description to your advantage and make sure that you're integrating those keywords specifically from the job description. So one example that I always like to use is management versus leadership. A lot of people use those terms interchangeably. But if the job description is looking for someone that is a project manager, someone who can manage personnel, someone who can manage teams, uh, you know, the, the recruiter or hiring manager is probably going to uh, be searching for management. Now, if they're looking for a leader, someone who can lead projects, who can lead teams, you know, who can, you know, lead and execute whatever it is, programs, then they may search for leadership. And even if you have, you know, the management and the leadership experience, if you fit the bill, but you don't have that keyword in your resume, you may get passed up. So it's just really important to keep all of that in mind. Again, especially when there are so many applicants per job opening, you really want to make sure that you can get the right keywords in there anytime you can. So, you know, if you do 
uh, if you're applying for jobs, one of the things that I always suggest is to um, you know, review the job descriptions and see if there are specific skills or anything like that uh, you know, that you can integrate into your resume. I don't know, can you guys see the, the PowerPoint? Let's see. No, it went away. I'm not sure what happened. I just see your pretty face. No, I did that because oh, I wanted everybody to see you. For, you were talking, Michelle. I did that. So I, I oh, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure. It's fine. Um, but yeah, so it, it is really important to make sure that you have all of that information integrated into your resume so that, you know, you can get through that initial stage of applications because, you know, one thing that you always want to make sure and keep in mind is that a resume alone will not get you a job. That's something that I always like to stress to people. The resume will get you through that first step of the application and that's what's really important. And so the next thing that employers always really look for are metrics and achievements. And so one way that I always like to explain it, one thing that I think is really important to you know, consider is that anyone can say that they're good at their job, but very few people can actually show it. So particularly a great example of that is um, you know, in sales. So anyone can say, okay, I have top sales. I am a top recognized sales executive. And that's fantastic. But if someone can't look at your resume and see what you've actually achieved, then it's kind of a hollow claim. So you really want to make sure that you can provide evidence to your claim that you are a great employee. So anytime that you can show results and achievements, you absolutely want to integrate that information into your resume. Uh, you know, it gives perspective on what you can do. And this will absolutely help someone look at your resume and say, okay, look at what that person achieved at their previous role. That means that they could achieve this in this current role or for my company. So you always want to help people visualize you in the role, you, excuse me, in the role that you are applying for. So integrating metrics and achievements is a really great way to do that. And then the final thing, um, and I can talk about metrics and achievements for a really long time, but in light of timing and making sure that everyone has uh, you know, enough time to speak on their topic, I'm gonna move on to the third and final thing amongst many others, but the third and final thing that I'm going to speak about today, and that is red flags. So you know, anytime that someone looks at a resume, there are a few red flags that you know, I'm sure any of my other panelists can speak on as well that employers or hiring managers will look for. This first one that I'm going to talk about, it's a little bit less of an issue now because of COVID. You know, so many people are working remotely that it's definitely more common to apply to jobs outside your region. But when I talk to recruiting managers and hiring managers, one of the things that they always tell me that they look for is location. And because of that, particularly, you know, I know everyone is located all over the country, you know, in a place like Los Angeles or San Diego or New York or something like that, you know, a commute is a big ordeal. And so one of the things that I have found that a lot of recruiters really take into consideration is commute because if you are going to be spending, you know, two plus hours in the car each way to work or on the subway or however you're getting there, I mean, that could absolutely affect your work ethic and how you feel about your, the job. So that's one of the things that, you know, employers will look for. Again, now not so much, especially with the remote work. If you are re working remotely, that's not as big of an issue, but that's one of the things that, you know, previously people would consider and, you know, look at as, as a potential red flag. Another thing is, you know, if you are consistently moving from job to job, that can make recruiters or hiring managers wonder if, you know, maybe you're just not finding roles that you're happy with, or if you're not applying to jobs that you'd be a good fit for. There's definitely a difference between contract work, uh, and, and that's important to note, because particularly in tech or in design or, you know, any, in any capacity that you're doing freelance work, that's a different story. But if you're applying to jobs where ideally you should be able to grow with the company and stay there, but you're consistently moving and moving through these jobs, that could be considered a red flag. So I would suggest, you know, if you are someone that has been doing a lot of contract jobs or something like that, there is nothing wrong with that. But I would suggest grouping it into potentially a freelance position where you note the different contract positions or the companies that you've worked for, or potentially if you're using a temp agency, use the temp agency as the job, uh, or I'm sorry, as the company, 
and put as the job title, you know, contract IT employee or contract administrative assistant, whatever it is. And again, note those different jobs that you worked for, but that kind of streamlines your resume and allows you to create a more cohesive job entry than a bunch of chopped up short-term positions. So, I mean, I can talk on this all day. I'm happy to answer any questions, but again, I just wanna make sure that everyone, uh, you know, gets to their topic and everyone gets to speak on this because we have a lot of great information throughout this entire webinar. But, you know, I know we're gonna have time for questions at the end. If I can answer any questions uh, for anyone at the end, I would be happy to do so because all of this, this is very important information when we're, you know, applying for jobs and in a very uncertain <laughs> job market. I think there actually are a few questions, but we can wait until the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I saw them come in too. We got some good ones, Michelle. So thank you for that. And you're right, it is a very important topic in this uh, job market. So I'm glad to see that uh, people have some questions that we'll be able to get to. Awesome. Before we jump into that, we're going to have uh, Dana talk to everybody about how to optimize LinkedIn so that you are not only getting seen, but finding opportunities as well. So Dana. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hey guys. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about LinkedIn and give you a couple, four takeaways to help you optimize your profile, basically so you can reach recruiters better. There's a lot of things you can do on LinkedIn that would take a lot of time to go through, um, but given that we're uh, talking about job searching right now, I'll kind of focus in on what's going to be most helpful to job seekers. So. Uh, number one, LinkedIn is the number one tool for the most part used by recruiters and hiring managers. Um, so generally speaking, there are about 20 million companies on LinkedIn, about 14 million active jobs, give or take at any uh, given time. And it's estimated about over, I would say well over 90%, honestly, of recruiters use LinkedIn to fill job openings. So it's really important to have a presence on there. And there's really three main reasons for that. First one being you know, to build your network as you move throughout your career. That has a lot of benefits just in general. Um, the second is really just increasing your visibility to hiring managers by being there, being searchable. And then the third is it really gives you the opportunity to research potential companies, potential employers and opportunities. And again, there's a lot of different uh, functions that allow you to do that. And, you know, you can learn a lot about a company on LinkedIn that can actually be really helpful, you know, when you're tailoring some of your materials, who's working there, you know, do you know anybody in your network? Um, and I'll throw one other reason out there, too, that it's really good to have a LinkedIn presence, and that's just search optimization in general. I mean, if you've ever done, you probably all have done a Google search on ourselves, you probably notice if you have a profile, it kind of pops up toward the top of the the uh, search results there because obviously LinkedIn is a very reputable site. So it gives you a little bit of control too over some of the information that um, people can see, see about you there. Uh, let's see. Oops, sorry, my screen went a little funny there. Great. Uh, so second point I want to emphasize is the completeness of your profile. And that that's important because it really impacts how you um, show up in search results when somebody's looking for a candidate on LinkedIn with your skill set. So really, it, it kind of comes down to how you fill out the profile and what content and keywords that you put in there. I'll talk about keywords in a second. But the first step is really to fill out the core sections. And what those are, are your headline, the about or the summary section right under that, the experience section, of course, uh, the education section, if applicable, and then uh, the skills section usually below that. So these sections are important because they, they feed into the algorithm that, that basically impacts how you show up in search results. So that's what I mean by the completeness of the profile. So with the headline, uh, first and foremost, this one's important because this one really is heavily, uh, I don't know what the term is here, but it, 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 it impacts the search results pretty heavily, maybe more so than some of the other sections. So you really kind of want to come up with a headline that speaks to your core skill set or your target job title. Um, if you're employed, obviously that's a concern. You know, you can include it as your, your job title so as not to raise any suspicions. 
Um, but you can kind of com combine that with some good keywords. Uh, for instance, my, my title might be, you know, founder of Brooklyn Resume Studio slash uh, expert career writer and personal brand strategist. So you see it includes my job title, but it also, you know, speaks to my core skill set. I actually really like Christie's headline too. If you go to, if you see her profile, any anyone who's speaking on here actually has. I looked at everybody's LinkedIn, but everybody's got a really good uh, use of LinkedIn. But Christie's has, you know, author of your personal career coach, and then she supplements that by saying marketing executive, career expert, career expert and speaker, uh, nonprofit fundraiser, and Iron Man, which is really interesting. Um, speaks to some of her personal accomplishments. So you can see where it has her title, so to speak, but then it kind of works in some of the other key things that, that would be keywords that would be interesting. Uh, so then underneath the summary, there's like a, underneath the uh, headline, there's a summary section where you can add a brief introduction about yourself. Again, just a good way to introduce who you are, add some keywords in there that are gonna be really important, and just kind of give a brief overview to kind of pique people's attention. So when you move under that, it's the experience section, uh, which I don't have the visual up here to show you, but you've probably seen the experience section. You can list out all of your job titles, descriptions. Uh, I would say go very high level on LinkedIn with the descriptions and the other sections. You know. It's not necessary to go into every detail. It's not necessary to include every job on there, much like the resume. The thing you wanna keep in mind about LinkedIn is, you know, it's not your resume. So one, you don't wanna just copy and paste it over because two, you're hitting such a broader audience on LinkedIn. I mean, millions and millions of members, depending how your uh, security settings are set, if it's visible. So you don't have that ability to tailor LinkedIn really the way that you would a resume if you were sending it out to a specific company. So keep in mind, you know, you don't want to have information on there that's not going to be relevant to some of your audience. So keep it high level, treat it like an introduction of who you are and what you bring to the table and just really what your core skills are. Uh, before I go into the other sections, there's a couple other sections. I do want to just touch on uh, keyword optimization, which is the third point here. Very important on LinkedIn. Um, and to the point here, you know, really the best profiles, the ones that really perform the best are optimized for keyword search. And, and I mean, this is really the basis of LinkedIn, right? It's a digital platform. It's searchable. So you really want to keep that in mind when you're uh, putting the content into your profile. So we had mentioned, you know, filling out the, uh, the headline, the summary, all of those sections, you know, as you move down through the profile, keep that in mind, you know, you have the education, you can add things like awards, uh, you can add volunteer and professional organizations, projects that you've worked on, things like that. Uh, but the ones that I mentioned earlier are really kind of those core sections that weigh most heavily in search. One also I really want to emphasize is the skills section. That usually falls, I think, like below your education. This is also important because the skills that you include in there are also very heavily searched because a recruiter will go into LinkedIn, they'll plug in a couple skill sets, you know, business development, sales, relationship building, things that are really um, important in the candidate that they're looking for. And, uh, you know, people who have those skill sets and have endorsements for those skill sets, that's another topic, but um, those are gonna be really the people who kind of float up to the top of the search. So you definitely wanna work on your skills section. You wanna put things in there that are really like your strengths, your core competencies, just anything that you, you consider uh, something you're proficient in that you use day to day in your job. Um, I saw somebody in the kind Adam had asked about how to find keywords and we can speak more to that after this, but if you're not sure how to, how to optimize LinkedIn with keywords, there's, there's a couple things you can do. With LinkedIn, I would definitely suggest, you know, looking at other people in your industry and, you know, go to their profiles, use them as a guide, you know, see what kind of language, but especially see what kind of skills they have in that in that uh, section there, because that'll give you a good idea of, of some of the terms that you should have in your profile. And then the other way, w w this is good for the resume too, is um, just look at the job description. You know, what kind of language, what are really like the core 
skills that they're emphasizing. And that'll give you an idea of some of the search terms that you really want to work in there. Okay, take a breath. <laughs> Number four, uh, another reason LinkedIn is such a great tool is just really the wealth of functionality that it offers job seekers to help them kind of stand out and, and build visibility. Um, I mean, walking you through LinkedIn and all its different versions, different functionalities would be an entirely different presentation in itself, but I'm going to summarize a couple of, couple of functions that are at least worth looking into as job seekers. Um, so the first of them, actually, I'm going to, I'm just typing this in the chat here to everybody. I'm just listing them out because I'm going to run through them really quickly. Okay, so the first one I would mention is in-mails. And if you have a premium version of LinkedIn, you probably know what this is. The basic version includes them. LinkedIn uh, in-mails are just messages, you know, that you can send to people you're not connected to. So if it's someone you don't know and you're not comfortable sending a uh, connection request, you can send an in-mail as a way to introduce yourself and maybe ask a question, build a connection that way. Another one is the recommendations. You'll see that further down on your profile. Really great to have recommendations from peers, from supervisors, uh, from clients or vendors. Uh, the activity feed and just your ability to post content on LinkedIn. So when you sign on, you know, like other social media networks, the homepage has all the different activity from your network. Um, and that's a really great tool too, because you can post other people's content, you can share questions, you can comment on things. And it's just a good way to kind of engage with your industry, connect with other peers. Uh, a couple more, the groups is really great for the same reasons, just connecting with other people in your industry. Usually the groups are focused on either a specific industry, specific uh, school, organization, or some kind of subject matter. But it's a great way to get connect with people in your field and sometimes access job opportunities that might not be posted on the regular job board too. Uh, I mentioned some other things in here. You can post video and media to your profile. If you want to put a download of your resume up there, if you're comfortable doing that publicly, you can do that. You can put your website up there, or maybe even a project that you worked on. The voice memos is something that's available on the, on the mobile version. And uh, that's good if you have a name that first or last name that's often mispronounced. Um, it's on there so that you can do a quick voice memo to give hiring managers an idea of how to accurately pronounce your name. Believe it or not, mine gets mispronounced all the time. Um, and then finally, company insights. Uh, LinkedIn is really good in terms of providing information on companies, whether that's, uh, you know, who's been hired there recently, what are they doing in the industry. You can see if anybody you know or within your network works for that company. So. Uh, if you go to the company pages, you can really get a wealth of information about, uh, you know, that might help you with, say, your cover letter or your resume, something like that. Great. Um, so that is pretty much LinkedIn in a, in a nutshell. Um, my email is included at the end of the presentation. And as Michelle mentioned, you know, we'll, we'll, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about this. And yeah, a lot of good information. Great, thank you so much, Dana. We had a lot of good questions coming in, so I look forward to hearing your answers to those as well. Uh, I will go through this. I have a um, video and a blog post on this. So these are the four key tips that I have picked out from uh, quite a few others. So in light of the time, I'm gonna focus on just a couple of the, the main ones for when you get the interview and it's time to do that virtual or video interview that you are prepared. And that's one of the main things I want to emphasize is to be practiced and prepared. This is not something you want to do on the fly and just uh, jump on and assume you're going to be a master of a virtual interview. So make sure you go through all of the technology first and you know um, if you need to have a special, if it's not on Zoom, is it a, a different type of platform that you've downloaded or a, you know that you can link to and, and all that's fine and so you're not scrambling at the end and having that flop sweat of oh my god I can't get on with the technical or you know something's not working so but the the practical tips are your camera angle and this is a common mistake that I see that people use uh, put their computer on their desk or 
and they're looking down. And um, as the young people know with their selfies, a much better angle is looking slightly up. So if you have to put your computer on books or a box, uh, one of those Amazon boxes that you're probably getting from shopping um, during COVID, um, you know, prop it up and get it above so that your, the lens of the camera is just slightly above uh, your head. So you have a, a natural lift to your chin. Um, nothing worse than seeing somebody, you know, looking down or, um, you know, feeling that you're looking up somebody's nose or face during an interview. Uh, the second important tip is lighting. Uh, so important you want the lighting in front of you and not behind you. If it's behind you, you you're, you're dark, you're in a shadow and nobody can see you. And you may have been on calls or, or conferences where that happened and you didn't know why that particular person looked like they were in a cave and somebody else you know, looked beautiful and lit and, and young and delightful. Um, that's because of the lighting. So you want the lighting in front. It can be in front of a window. Uh, you could put a lamp in front of your, your kitchen table or your desk or something if you, if you don't have natural lighting. Uh, but you do wanna make sure that uh, you're well lit. Um, they make little lights you can add to your, your phone or your computer that aren't very much money that can clip on. It can give you an extra little lighting as well if you, if you need it. Lighting from the side can sometimes work, but it can also drop a shadow across your face. So you wanna, you wanna practice that. And, and going back to my recommendation of making sure you're, you're practiced and perfected, uh, if you know your interviews at two o'clock, then on a different day at two o'clock, you know, set up and see what it's gonna look like. Because if you're using natural lighting, the, the sun is going to be at a different point at a different time of day. And so what might work great at 11 a.m. when you practice may not work quite so well at two o'clock when your interview is. So uh, give it a whirl during the time of your actual interview. Audio is super important because they do want to see what you look like, but they want to hear what you say. And that's really going to be the crux of your interview. And if you rely on your computer audio, it's not always the best. It's not always the crisp, crispest and it sometimes can crackle. Or, and if you're not close enough, you're, you're not picked up and you don't want to be on top of your computer trying to have everybody hear you. So I recommend getting a, an external microphone and just plugging it into your computer. Earbuds with a microphone is absolutely fine. Uh, it works really well. You sound good. You'll be able to hear them well. Uh, I'm wearing a lavalier mic. You can do one of those. They're not too expensive. Uh, but any type of external mic I, I highly recommend would be super beneficial to making sure they can hear every word you say and not want to end the interview early because they can't hear you or it's popping and it's just not a comfortable situation. And then your body language is a, a super important tip I want to talk about because you are on camera. Uh, you want to remember that if you're fidgeting or you're looking bored or you've got your arms crossed and looking not very open and inviting, um, they're going to they're gonna see that. So you want to approach it that you are sitting in somebody's office or conference room interviewing and keep all of the and sit up straight and pull your shoulders back which i just realized i wasn't doing well enough um uh, and the two things that do take practice are smiling as you talk and looking at the camera lens and not at the screen and when you're on a zoom call or any type of uh, slack or skype and you're it's very tempting to look at the screen because that's where the other person is but when you look at the screen, like I'm doing now, you're, you don't look like you're looking at the interviewee. So you wanna look at where the camera lens is on your phone, tablet, or computer. So it appears that you are making eye contact. So this is, again, not something that typically comes natural to everybody. So it's something you'll probably wanna practice either um, with on FaceTime or with a friend or get on Zoom and or just staring at your computer and realizing where the lens is. You can put a post-it note or somebody's picture right around it so it feels like you're talking to somebody and get used to, to looking at that lens and then trying to smile as much as possible as you're talking. Again, typically not something that we do, but it does make you look much more approachable and confident and you'll feel better as uh, you're giving your answers as well. So. 
again, much more tips on my blog and on a video, but hopefully if you, at a minimum, if you walk away with making sure you're practiced, you've set up the tech, you have a good um, set, I call it a set, the background is clean and neat, uh, you don't have a pile of laundry behind you or uh, dirty dishes in the kitchen that maybe um, you didn't know were there but could be picked up on. So you want to make sure, again, you're uh, looking at what the, the screen is before you go live. Uh, making sure you have good lighting, making sure you have a uh, microphone so everybody can hear you, and then uh, your body language and keeping in mind that everything you are doing is being picked up on and to smile and look at the camera lens. So um, those are my tips. I'm going to uh, tell you for tips like all of those that we just presented today and more, uh, you can find those in your personal career coach, mm -hmm. Real World Real Experiences for Early Career Success. It's available for pre-launch, uh, pre-sale right now, but it is available on Wednesday the 30th in ebook and paperback. You can buy it at your favorite retailer. Uh, Carrie, Dana, and Michelle and I are authors, but so are another 20 authors, including Bill Gates Sr., Katherine Schwarzenegger, Tori Dunlap, Caroline Leach. So we've got some really great career experts, authors, and uh, speakers who have contributed stories to the book to help you. And, and that's what makes our book a little different is that it's our own personal stories. So rather than what I call a you know stuffy old how-to book, it's our stories of our business experience and, and how that, what we learned and did well and maybe not so well to, to make it an enjoyable read, but also a very informative one. So we hope you'll check that out. And before we jump into the Q&A, a reminder that uh, for those of you that are here live, you'll get a copy of my free, or you'll get a copy of my ebook free, um, that your complete guide to cover letters. So if you would like a, a, to grab a copy of that, send a, a note in the chat so that we can uh, find you and make sure you get a copy of that. It's again, your complete guide to cover letters and in it, I go through um, what you need to do to write a cover letter. There's some templates, there's some opening lines you can use, um, how to put them together and how to send it off and, and some really great information to make sure you are uh, having a very uh, optimized and impactful cover letter when you send in your resume. So I want to get, oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot. We're already the number three on the hot new releases on Amazon for your personal career coach. So we're really excited about that and looking forward to getting this information. It's been a long time coming, uh, five year labor of love. So I'm very excited to, to have it out to the world next week. So questions, let's see how we're doing on time. We have, oh, well, we're gonna have to get going. We've got some really good questions. I wanna get to them. So for those of you that can stay, we will um, happily stay a little longer to get your questions answered. Um, Carrie, I'm going to throw this one to you. Uh, some, uh, Janie wants to know, are letters of reference still important? Do we have Carrie? Okay. Um, how about Dana? We'll come back to that if Carrie comes back. Uh, she says, I have trouble getting interviews. How do I make my resume stand out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're not getting uh, any kind of response, often it is something you can, in the resume that's not coming through. Uh, in terms of standing out, I mean, I mean, first and foremost, the biggest thing is that it just really has to convey whatever it is they're they're looking for, the core skills, the core experience, and and keep in mind too, a job description is really almost like a wish list of their perfect candidate. So it's okay, uh, you know, if they don't, if you don't have everything on there, what will make you stand out? If you're missing something, a skill, experience, something like that, what else do you bring to the table? You know, what else can you emphasize, whether it's something you've done outside of work that speaks to your leadership skills or, you know, some other project or type of thing that you've worked on that maybe can bring value. Um, you know, visually, I, I like to, you know, design resumes and with subtle way that will stand out, you know, with a little bit more of a modern template. Definitely keep the uh, graphics 
at bay and don't go too crazy on the look and feel of it. But I think a combination of really strong content that speaks to the job and it has to be clear too. Don't make them go looking for information along with a really nice presentation is, is really going to stand out. And I've had hiring managers say that to, to clients and candidates. Great. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to throw this one to you. What is the best way to stand out when applying for jobs? That was from Erica. Yeah, I mean, piggybacking off of what Dana said, everything she said was fantastic. I completely agree with her. Um, when it comes to applying for jobs, I mean, on top of everything that Dana said, one of the things that I always suggest is leveraging your connections. I mean, any way you and any time you can get your resume in front of the right person. I mean, yes, applying online is just kind of the way that we all do things right now, and there's nothing wrong with that. But anytime you can either connect with the maybe the hiring manager on LinkedIn or, you know, connect with the recruiter that has posted the job, or if you have a friend that works at the company that can put your resume in front of the right person. So again, this is not instead of doing any of the things that Dana said, but just on top of that, anytime that you can connect with someone to make yourself stand out so that they actually can see who you are and put a face to the name and not just have a resume in front of them with a bunch of words and you know a name on a piece of paper. Anytime you can make yourself a real person. I mean, I know that sounds kind of funny. Obviously, we're all real people, but anytime you can establish that connection with someone, that's really going to help you stand out and help you, you know, become a real and viable candidate that someone can visualize in the role. So one of the questions that we got, well, uh, was how do you network in a virtual world? So Dana and Michelle and, and uh, I can offer some ideas too, but uh, yeah, you know, the coffee connections maybe aren't happening right now. So I think this is a, this go back to LinkedIn for sure. Um, it's very easy to connect with people on LinkedIn and um, locate people. Um, I, I, would, I would use, I see people not utilizing it nearly as much as they could, but that's really the easiest way just because all of the functionality is built in to kind of take away any awkwardness or any question. It's, it can be really simple just to kind of find people and connect with them and just kind of jumpstart a conversation. I think that's the key thing is um, just approach things like a conversation. Don't ask for favors right up front if you don't know somebody. But a good way in is just ask them about themselves. You know, how did they get in the industry? What do they like about their company? Just kind of start a conversation like that. I think that's a great tip. Uh, one thing that I want to point out that I I would hope that anyone would agree, but I think it's really important, especially when connecting on LinkedIn to put a note in the connection request. I mean, make it personal again, just like what Dana said, start the conversation because one of the things that I get a lot is people connect with me. And I mean, I understand I'm a resume writer. Often people connect with me if they want to work with me, but the first thing that I think when someone connects with me and I don't know who they are is why? Like, do they want to start a conversation? Do they want to work with me? So I would encourage anyone when you are connecting with someone on LinkedIn, if it is someone that you really don't know at all, I would just, you know, put a few words, just like what Dana said, start a conversation. But again, make yourself personal, personable, make yourself a real person so that someone wants to learn more about you. And I, I'll piggyback off that. If, if there's not a personal note when I get a connection, I often think that they're trying to sell me something. I so, agree. So yeah. Yeah, you don't want to come across as that. So yeah, definitely just um, make it sound like you're really interested and enthusiastic about their industry, their company, themselves or whatever it is. And then when you get, and I totally agree with Dana, don't ask for a favor or don't ask for a, a lead or an introduction. If you don't know them yet, work your way up to that. And then you can also work your way up to asking for an informational interview via Skype, Slack, you know, Zoom, whatever, because um, since so many people are working from home, you're not asking them to take time away from their office environment or like it, sometimes those were harder back in the day. Now it's like, well, I can jump on a 10 minute oh, call. Maybe I don't even need to see them. I'll just, you know, old fashioned call. And so that's a great way to, to continue to, to network. And then when you establish a relationship, you can also ask, well, who else, you know, do you have anybody else that would be help me learn more about this industry and, and continue to network from that way. Let's see, what else do we have? Uh, this came in, Michelle, when you were talking about how do you identify keywords? If you're focused on keywords, both, I guess, Dana too, on your LinkedIn profile and your resume, how do you, 
how do you uncover which ones you should be including? Uh, I don't, do you want to start, Dan, or you want me to start? Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I mean, when it comes to um, uh, resume, when you're trying to figure out keywords, I mean, the easiest thing to do is really look at the job descriptions, see what words are repeated throughout the job descriptions, see what is listed under the required skills and what's, you know, is a need to have versus a nice to have, because I do think it's really important. You know, Dana said this, but the job description is, you know, a perfect wish list of what they're looking for. But at the same, so you don't have to hit every single skill, but at the same time, if you don't have the main requirements, then you're probably not going to be able to execute the job successfully. So it's important to figure out that balance of what they, what really needs to be done in the job, what skills you really need. So again, under the required skills, maybe it's a software, maybe it's a certification that you need in order to, you know, legally do the job. You have to figure out what it is, but I would say definitely just look at the job description. I mean, it's there to help you. So, you know, see what words are repeated, see what uh, requirements are listed, if there are, again, any certification specialized training, but more often than not, it will be fairly simple to see what they really are looking for because they'll repeat it throughout the job description. There's one thing, I, or two things actually I want to add. One, there's a really good um, tool website called Job Scan that mm -hmm. will scan your resume, pull out all the key, scan your resume, it'll also scan the job description and it will immediately pull out all the keywords. Um, so Job Scan, you just Google it, I, can, I think it's jobscan.io. Um, the other thing is also think about the intricacies in terms of the keywords and the language. What I mean by that, an example I use is one job description might say programmer, another description might say developer, another one might say software engineer. Um, so, you know, look at how they're referring to the role or the skill set because there might be multiple ways to describe it. Mm -hmm. And you might get knocked out by the ATS for using one word over another. So pay attention, you know, just to how they're describing things and then try to mimic that in the resume. Since we're on resumes, we just got a question. If they're relatively new uh, and looking for a job, do you recommend a functional resume or a chronological? I personally use a combination of both. I think it's really important to have the chronological resume. Uh, you know, I'm happy to hear if anyone else has anything to say, but every recruiter that I have ever spoken to wants to see the actual career history, it's at least at some place on the resume. So I like to do kind of a combination of the functional and chronological where I include, you know, skills and I like to have a skills matrix towards the top of the document, but I do think it is important, at least somewhere on the resume to have the job history listed out. 100% agree. That's usually my approach to yeah. kind of a combination that talks about the skill sets and then does give some idea of experience. Um, I don't know if it carries on, but from a recruiter standpoint, I think it's kind of ineffective to not show really anything about your experience. It just, it just won't give enough context, in my opinion. Though. I agree. One uh, question we had earlier, too, was can you apply for multiple jobs at the same organization? Is that Okay, or does that hurt your chances of, of any of the jobs? Who are we asking? Uh, I don't know, throwing it out. Do you guys have an uh, opinion? I would say yes, apply. The, the company, the, you know, not always does one department talk to the other, they might not even know. It shows your enthusiasm. If you're qualified, I wouldn't flash my, email, uh, my resume to a bunch of jobs if I'm not qualified for them at all. But if you're qualified, and I don't see any downside. Yeah. Yeah. So you could have different recruiters handling different recs. So okay. If, okay. if there's one, more than one you're qualified for, just be sure you're specifying. I see a lot of people leave that out in the cover letter and you have a big company with hundreds of recs openings, you know, they're not going to know what you're applying for. Um, and maybe space it out a little bit too. But, you know, again, you, you can do that. Just be specific about which one. Yeah, and I mean, I think that you could also, again, it depends on how connected you are with the company and if you're really just applying online, but it is worth saying, you know, if you feel really strongly that you want to work at the company, if you are very interested in that company in particular, I think you absolutely can reach out to the recruiter and hi or hiring manager and say, hey, look, I really care about your company. I've been following this company for a while. I know that these two positions are open or three positions, whatever. Um, you know, I think that I have the qualifications that I actually could take on any of these roles, but 
I'm really interested in working with this company in particular. So I'm open to the opportunities based on what's available. We got another really good question in or related to resume. So I'll throw it to, to Dana and Michelle. Uh, if you want to change careers, but you don't have experience in the direction that you want to go, what, what do you recommend? Yeah, this all comes down to transferable skills. I get this a lot when mm -hmm. clients that want to either get out of a field or, um, you know, switch up the job that they're doing. So if you don't have the experience, you have to look at what else you do have that can bridge that gap, whether it's a different skill set, maybe it's something you've done outside of the job. Um, but basically, you're just looking for something else that's going to that you've done in your your current field that will transfer over and allow you to be able to do the job in this other field effectively. And that's really going to be what your selling point is. Again, if you Google transferable skills, and there's probably a couple of chapters too in the book on this, um, that's really going to going to help you write a resume for a career change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many skills that can be used in a variety of different careers. But the other thing that I would encourage is, you know, look at these side projects, look at these non-traditional, you know, work experience, work experiences that you may have. So, you know, say that you are in a corporate job and you're maybe trying to get into something more creative. Well, have you designed your own website? Have you written guest articles on a blog? Have you volunteered anywhere? So I would encourage you not only to look at the transferable skills, which are super important, but you know, take on like bite-sized projects. It doesn't have to be anything huge. Uh, you know, the more little projects and affiliations that you can add or online courses, whether it's on LinkedIn Learning has an amazing online platform where you can take a lot of courses. So you're in turn, not only are you learning, you're adding something to your resume, a new skill and a new course, and you're showing the motivation to learn and educate yourself as you transition into this new career. So just, you know, the more you can add from this career or this industry that you're trying to transition into, the more your resume will look like a resume for that industry. So it's just kind of over time being able to take on little projects and classes and skills that you can add. And I would add that volunteering is a great way. Uh, the, the nice thing about nonprofit organizations, they're usually so excited to have the volunteer help. They'll let you do something that you're not 100% qualified for. So if um, you are, have been in marketing, but you're interested in finance, you, they're usually open to having you join the finance committee and you can get your feet weight that way. It's a great opportunity to network and meet new people and get additional skills and have something for, for your res resume. So. Totally. And one thing I want to note on that is that, um, you know, they've done a bunch of studies and I, I think it's 27% um, chance, like, you know, 20% 27% chance higher uh, matriculation. People don't care if you were paid or not paid for an experience and experience is an experience. So a lot of people come to me and they ask, well, I only volunteered there. That, that means I can't put it on my resume. Right. And at the end of the day, whatever experience you bring, whatever adds value to you as a candidate, you can add that to your resume. So volunteer experience, I mean, employers look at that and they see there are a lot of great things that come with volunteer. I mean, it shows that you're willing to help others. It shows time management, it shows multitasking, all these different skills. Um, you know, don't be afraid to add that onto your resume. We got uh, a question again on the resume side. If you're willing to relocate, should you note that? Or with things being different, remote working, do you need to, to even address that? I'll often note it on the resume. Um, you know, people have said, if you have a local address, put that on there, obviously. Sometimes what I do, I do is just denote the market that either you're in or that you're trying to relocate to. So if I have somebody who's in New York, who's trying to locate, relocate to Los Angeles, I might just simply denote on the resume, New York, New York slash Los Angeles, California, mm -hmm. because that is what I'm trying to communicate is that this person has an interest in working in these job markets and is available. And I think that's whatever way you state it, the important thing is to, you know, denote that you are available and that you can kind of make that transition. And that's a good thing, I think, to speak to in the cover letter as well. And if you can kind of put some kind of timeline in there, I can be available within, say, two weeks to start, you know, if that's possible. Um, I can be available immediately to interview. Obviously, that's no problem now with, with uh, Zoom. But I think 
um, speaking to the transition can help you get over that hurdle a little bit too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a little bit of a tricky subject sometimes depending. I mean, it's it's really not as big of a deal now. Sometimes I would recommend just leaving. I see a lot of people leave their um, location off the resume altogether. And just because, particularly when applying online, because sometimes before uh, recruiters or hiring managers would pass someone up just because they didn't want to deal with the hassle of location. So sometimes that can help you. But again, um, you know, if you are doing that, I always tell people, make sure that if they do contact you, you are very transparent the minute they contact you. I'm relocating, either, you know, my spouse got a job and we're relocating, or I'm just looking to relocate to the area. But, you know, I would never recommend lying. I think that's really important. You don't want to give them information that they don't have. So even if you leave your resume, or I'm sorry, even if you leave your location off your resume, I would be very clear if they do contact you of the relocation or that, you know, and how much time you need X, Y, and Z, just make sure that you're very clear with everything. But again, now it's, it's not as big of a deal again with so many companies going remote. Good. What about, um, I know we covered LinkedIn, Dana, is there any one particular thing that makes a LinkedIn profile pop out or get attention from a recruiter than another? Uh, I think it's a combination of, you know, having, having enough information on there to kind of give a nice impactful introduction of who you are without going overboard. So as I said earlier, you know, you don't want to copy and paste the resume, have tons of bullets on there, but you should have something filled out. I, mean, I see a lot of people that just kind of set up the profile and then they don't really put anything on there. A lot of people don't even update it or keep it updated. There is a function um, and you can find this under, I believe like the, the profile settings or your privacy settings where you can enable a little tool that says alert uh, recruiters that I'm open to job opportunities. So what will happen when a recruiter sees your profile, they will see that you're actively looking for job opportunities. The great thing about that is LinkedIn does its best to block it from your current organization so that your internal recruiters won't see that uh, and get you into trouble. So that's one way to, to give yourself a little bit more visibility. But again, just kind of comes down to having the right keywords in there. So when they're searching for a particular skill or area of expertise, you come up further and further. And then the headline too, because if you've ever seen search results, you see they'll have your photo, just your headline and maybe one little line under that. So you wanna make sure you're kind of optimizing that preview too by having a, a good headline in there. So we've got a couple more questions. I know we are going over. I appreciate everybody hanging out here, um, but everybody's hanging out. So I think that means they're, they're like in the Q&A. Um, if you have the choice, if the employer, if you're applying for a job and they've given the choice to send your resume or your LinkedIn, which one do you send? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. What do you think, Dana? I don't know. I would say probably, well, no, I mean, it's, it's both. It's your resume is more catered. I mean, so if it's to an employer, probably your resume, because hopefully you've catered that to the job you are applying to. So in that case, yeah, absolutely. You want that to get in front of them so they can really see you and envision you in the job. But if Good you're point. just kind of networking, probably LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn, I, I believe you can still apply to jobs using your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. Um, for the reason Michelle just mentioned, I don't necessarily recommend doing that because again, the whole, the whole point, the thing that's going to really give you the best chance is to tailor the resume. So if you are applying to a specific job or a specific company, I would try to tail send the resume and make sure that it's, it's customized. But at, to Michelle's point, you know, if you're just trying to make an introduction, totally okay to direct somebody to your LinkedIn profile. And you can put your LinkedIn uh, URL on your resume. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah. You should. So then they can always find you that way too. Uh, let's see, a couple last questions. Um, if I don't have a variety of jobs, is that a red flag on my resume? I don't think so. I mean, especially if you've been with a company for a long time, I would just be sure to, if you don't have a lot of, um, if you don't have a variety of jobs, I would just be sure to make sure and highlight what you've accomplished in the jobs that you do have. I don't know if anyone else has anything yeah. to think of on that, yeah, but yeah. I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, if you're starting your own business, can you put it on your resume, even if you've only had uh, one client? 
Yeah, I see this a lot because in the create, I work with a lot of creatives, so a lot of people who are freelancing or self employed. Um, I would say yes, with the you have to be prepared to speak to it in the interview as long as you're comfortable doing that. And you can say you're starting up your business. You, I'm not sure the context if it's something different or something related. But my rule of thumb is kind of you have to be able to speak honestly to whatever is on the resume, be able to speak honestly in the interview. And you can say, you know, I'm just starting out. I have, you know, one or two clients I'm working with. I think that's totally fine, especially if it's something related to, you know, your field or what you're looking to do. Absolutely. The one thing that I always uh, try to caution people on is just keep in mind, I mean, if you are applying to a very high level role, if you do have your own business, you know, you don't necessarily want to put CEO of another company at, on a resume when you're applying because you don't want them to think that you're not going to be able to put your all into the company. And I mean, depending on the company, I know in, um, you know, science in particular, uh, and I'm sure a lot of other fields, sometimes you do have to sign something that says you won't work for someone else. That's not always the problem when it's your own side, you know, business or something like that, but just something to keep in mind. You don't want someone to look at your resume and question if you're going to be able to successfully take on the job you're applying for if you're spending all of your time in your own company. Great. Thank you, ladies. Those were, um, that was really fun to do the q and I think we got through everything. We will double check. And if we didn't, we'll make sure to uh, get a hold of you and answer your questions. Uh, most importantly, if you uh, would like to reach out to Michelle, Dana, or Carrie, um, here's their information and they have provided it here so that uh, you can contact them if for any uh, assistance with resumes or recruiting or job hunting at all. Christy, yes. can you interrupt and um, Michelle or Dana, if you have um, Instagram or Facebook um, pages that you are active on, can you share those as well? Maybe also in the chat and just say it. Yep. Yeah, just Brooklyn Resume Studio on Facebook, facebook.com slash, I think it's just Brooklyn Resume Studio. If you search that, uh, I'm on there. My, my uh, Instagram is Right Styles, and I believe my Facebook is Right Styles Online. Same thing. Um, you should be able to search for Right Styles on Facebook and Instagram, but I can put this in here on the chat as well. But absolutely, I mean, if there's anything any of us can answer for you, I think we're all more than happy to do that. Great, thank you. And thank you, Lianca, for uh, catching that. Uh, uh, I welcome you to contact me as well, uh, either my website or the book's website, yourpersonalcareercoach.com. My socials are Christy Noel Career Coach on all of them. Uh, so you can find me there and hope you do. And again, as a reminder, your personal career coach is available now to buy, but you'll get it on Wednesday or it'll be shipped on Wednesday if you get the paperback. And your career survival guide is uh, my short guide to um, navigating your career during times of crisis like we're in now, and that's, that's available as well. So I want to thank you, everybody, for joining us. It was um, hopefully informative. We had uh, enjoyed having you here and being able to help you. Uh, and look forward to doing these again in the future. We will send out the uh, presentation and the recording. And if you would like uh, the free, uh, free ebook of the cover letters, your complete guide to cover letters, make sure you let us know or send me an email and we will make sure you get a copy of that with the presentation and uh, the video as well. Did I miss anything, anybody? Are we good? Okay. Well, great. Thank, thank, you, thank you all for joining us and uh, good luck in your search. And we hope we can help you and let us know if, uh, if you have success. We'd love to share in your success as well. Thanks for having us, Christy. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it.